This is the Lightning Podcast. So for the last couple of months, we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel. My goal was to show how even a book in the Old Testament, historical book, one that maybe not every Christian reads on a daily basis, can be used not only to learn about what God was doing back then and to gain some insight into his plan in the Old Covenant and how it actually has implications and significant for us today in the New Covenant of Jesus, but to also see how there's so much we could learn about God in our life and our faith through studying the lives of the people who lived in these times. And we learned quite a bit about Hannah, about Eli, about Elkanah, about Samuel. We saw how God raised up Samuel to become a judge who would lead the people in righteousness. And for a period of time, the nation was faithfully serving the Lord because Samuel was a man of God who knew God's word. And as a judge, he would he would rightfully instruct the people in God's law. But as Samuel got older, as we saw, the people seemed to stray away from God's plan for their nation and instead asked for a king. And we saw their reason wasn't because they wanted a righteous leader that would watch over them, protect them, and lead them in God's word. Because we see from this book and from the rest of scripture that God's people, whether it was ancient Israel or the church today, needs godly leadership. Because we need people who are anointed of God, who are obedient to God, to lead the rest of us so that we may learn and grow together through their leadership, and that so that we may also be raised up as leaders in our own right. So the nation certainly did need a king. We saw that from Judges, when there was no strong, authoritative leader who served the Lord. The people went on and did what they wanted to do, which was never God's word. So now that people are asking for a king, and that might seem like a good idea, But they were actually asking for a king so they could be like all the Gentile nations around them. But God, he didn't ignore their request because he had a greater plan in mind. And he told Samuel to go find for them this king. And we saw in chapter 9 how God led Saul, this young man from the tribe of Benjamin, to Samuel's door, so to speak, and chose him to be the king. But we learn that although God saw Saul in a very special way, picking him to be the first king over Israel, Saul had a very different view of himself. And I said in the previous episode that this actually carries with Saul throughout his entire time as king. This fear of man, this prizing man's opinion and man's perceptions of himself rather than what God says about him. And even though Samuel spoke to him and gave him this very detailed prophecy to confirm what God was saying, Saul didn't tell his family that he had been anointed as king. And we get to the end of chapter 10, we see what great length Samuel has to go to show the people of Israel that this is their rightful king. So we continue in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 17. Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzpah. And he said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, whom himself saved you from all your adversaries and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Then they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. So they ran and brought him from there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king! Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty, and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gabeah. And valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents. But he held his peace. 
So that's the end of chapter 10. And we see now Saul is formally made king, essentially what we call coronated. He is announced before the people by Samuel himself, the judge and the prophet of the nation. And Samuel has this very, we could say, elaborate process for revealing to the people who the person is. It's almost like a, a an unveiling, like, oh, we narrow it down to this tribe, narrow it down to this clan, narrow it down to this family, almost like building suspense. But then when he finally gets to Saul, you can imagine Samuel goes, all right, where's Saul, son of Kish? Come here, Saul. Come here. Come on down. And he's nowhere to be found. And they go looking and they find him hiding among the equipment. That's by the donkeys and the sheep and all the animals that they brought with them, the tents, all the stuff like that, all their packages. Now, he had already known and it was confirmed to him that he was called to be king. Saul was told by Samuel this directly, but yet he was still hiding because he was afraid of what people would think. In the last chapter, he was prophesying, okay, God, his spirit came upon him and he was speaking out prophetic words so that everyone recognized he was prophesying, but then they doubted him. Remember what they said? Is Saul a prophet? Okay, they said that because they were questioning his ability to do what he was doing. You know, no one could truly prophesy according to the Lord without the Spirit of the Lord being upon them. And God's not going to put his Spirit upon someone unless he's called them to be a prophet. And they all looked at Saul and were judging him according to the flesh, according to their natural senses. And they said, he's the son of Kish. They're farmers, they're shepherds, they got donkeys. What is he doing prophesying? He's not Samuel. He's not one of the prophets who was trained by Samuel. What is he doing, right? They were judging him based on appearances, which is a theme that will come up again in this book. They simply looked at him and dismissed him from what God was doing right in front of their very eyes. Now, this may seem peculiar and might be easy to write it off, but this is teaching us something very profound, that even when we're seeing God do something, even when we hear the word of God being spoken to us, even when we read it, we still can doubt it. We can still doubt it's God doing something. Now, why would we do that? Because we are not looking with our spiritual eyes. We're looking according to the flesh. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith and not by sight. See, sight is, is not just literally what your eyes can see. It's your, sev your <laughs> it's not seven senses, right? It's your six senses. It's your natural senses. It's your ability to look and reason in the natural. We were born in this earth and we grew up and learned how to relate to things naturally with our eyes, with our noses, with our mouth, with our ears, with our touch. Okay, the five senses. Did I say six? Five senses. But there's other senses, right? Your feelings, your emotions. They're all sensory uh, receptors that help us intake information, but it's all in the natural. Our physical bodies, what the Bible calls our flesh, or our human nature, is incapable of receiving and interpreting or understanding the things of the Spirit. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, A natural man cannot understand the things of God, for they are spiritually appraised. So we need the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Ephesians, to open the eyes of our understanding. To give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That means insight and understanding. But when we as Christians, see these people here weren't uncircumcised Gentiles who knew nothing about God. These were Israelites who were raised in the Torah, who had Samuel as their leader for decades. And we see the same situation happening later on in the chapter in verse 27, which we'll get to. But they know God, they know his word, but they still were thinking of Saul in the natural. And we can do the very same thing. We think and act in, in how we go about our daily lives. It's not based on our in understanding of this word of God. It's not based on what the Holy Spirit is teaching us day by day. It's according to what our eyes can see, when our ears can hear. It's according to the grumblings in our stomach. It's according to, you know, our constant worries and fears about our job or our bills or our family. It's worrying about our, our health or about what's going on in our communities or even the weather. We put so much stock in our natural circumstances and our natural reasoning that even when we're looking directly at something that God is doing, we miss it. Just like those people said, is Saul a prophet? Well, yes, he is. If he's prophesying, 
God is using him as a prophet. Now we know he was called to, to much more than a prophet. He was called to be a king. If they couldn't accept him as a prophet, how could they accept him as king? And sadly, Saul fell into that same kind of trap. He was thinking just like them. How can I be called to be king? I'm just a man, the son of Kish. We're not that a big we're not that much of a big deal. We raise donkeys for crying out loud. I'm not a Levite. I have nothing connected to Moses or Joshua or the great leaders before us. Why would God pick me? And we see here, even at his coronation, he's hiding amongst the donkeys. Because he was so afraid that people will say that same thing. You're not the king. How can you be a king? But look what actually happened when Samuel brought Saul out and brought him up before everyone. He said, look at this man. Isn't he the kind of man you want to be your king? He said, do you see whom the Lord has chosen? That there's no one like him in all the people? So the Bible is saying that Saul was head and shoulders taller than anyone else. We could imagine he was young. He was probably very strong and athletic. He probably was very good looking, probably had an amazing head of hair and this awesome beard. He was just the perfect, most attractive Israelite you could imagine. And so God picked him for a very specific reason. And we'll learn more about that as the story unfolds. And we see a very important dynamic about appearances, of course. But even though he was so tall and regal and impressive, there's still people who doubted because they were not looking at things according to God's plan. Now we could jump ahead and know that Saul doesn't work out as king, but at this point in time, we look back in chapter 9, and God said, I've chosen you to deliver my people from the Philistines. God had a wonderful plan for Saul. So his intentions was for Saul to be obedient and to Saul to be used by him. But we see from the very beginning, Saul was too caught up in what people thought and what he thought about himself to see what God was doing. It's very interesting. The passage begins where Samuel is reminding the people of their error about picking a king. And this always presents a conflict with a lot of people because we see God doing something for Israel, even though what they were asking for we know was wrong. And this tells us, a lot of people might interpret this differently, and you might even draw the wrong conclusions from it, that God gives us what we want, even if it's not right for us. I don't think that's what the scripture is saying here. What it's saying, though, is in spite of Israel's failure, in spite of their desire to be like the other nations, God still has another plan unfolding. And this reveals the sovereignty of God, that despite our shortcomings, despite our weaknesses, despite our sins and disobedience, God's plan is still unfolding. What they wanted was an earthly king to be like all the Gentile nations so they could look like the world and sound like the world and act like the world. God's plan was to one day bring about a king who would righteously govern Israel and rule over the whole world. His chosen one, that we know, of course, is Jesus, the Messiah. But he was preparing the way because he said in the beginning of this whole saga, I am their king and who ultimately is the king of Israel and king of the whole world. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. So God had always planned to bring about himself as their king, but as an earthly king who could come, live, and fulfill the law, and offer up his life as a sacrifice to save his people from their sins. So all the way back then in 1 Samuel, God is preparing the way by establishing an earthly rulership of Israel. Even though the Israelites were asking it for the wrong reasons, God was still using that to accomplish his plan. And we saw that it fulfills what the Bible says in Genesis, what you have meant for evil, God has meant for good. What the Bible says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. It also says God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called to his purposes. So we see that playing out right here. Even though Israel wants a king for the wrong reasons, and they want a king to be like the world around them, God is preparing the plan many, many, many years in advance for the coming of Jesus. And we see that in the Word of God, all things were made by Christ and for Christ. Even now, in this story in 1 Samuel, the nation of Israel was created for God. God didn't make Israel for their own benefit. God created Israel for people for himself, so that they might be representatives of the glory of God, the true God, in a very dark world, so that through him would come the knowledge of the truth to the ends of the earth, which we see through Jesus Christ in the good news.
So he didn't do it for them. He's doing it for himself so that his word, his truth might be proclaimed around the world. And all these years ago, in 1 Samuel 10, God was fulfilling his plan. You may think and look at this saying, well, this is many years before Jesus and many years before us. God was working out his plan for Jesus way back then. Yes, God is that patient. And God's plan is that intricate and that organized and that perfectly aligned that throughout history we see him working out the details, bringing about his plans, his purposes, bringing about his word of truth, bringing the Son, Jesus, to the earth, and then spreading that gospel to the ends of the earth. So nothing that happens in our lives, even today, is some sort of mistake or an error or some sort of result of your sin or disobedience. Yes, if you screw up and you disobey God, negative consequences will happen. And if you obey God and by his grace and wisdom working through you, you do good, good things will happen. But regardless of your ability to be quote unquote perfect, God's will is being accomplished in your life because trust me, bad things are going to happen and there might not be your fault. It's real easy to blame ourselves to say, oh, I'm going through this problem because I did this or I did that. Or we blame other people. I'm a victim of this society because they just didn't appreciate who I was. You can make up whatever excuse you want. You can come up with any argument that erases uh, your responsibility or makes you out to be a victim. The reality is bad things are going to happen. Difficult times happen. But God is working through them to accomplish a plan for his people. You may not see it right now. It might not make sense to you. You might not be able to put all the pieces together. But God is working out a plan. Our response is to be like Samuel. Not like Saul or not like the rest of the people who judged by their earthly senses. To be like Samuel who heard the word of the Lord and trusted it and obeyed it. We see at the end of the story, there are people who got it. They shouted out, long live the king. They recognized that Samuel was right in giving them Saul. And we see that there's some people went back to Samuel's house. And it seems almost kind of strange, like he's king now, now what do we do? Well, let me just go back home. There's no palace or castle. There's no great city for him to have. And because this is early, and it's small beginnings in a sense, but we see that there's a change taking place. God touched the hearts of certain valiant men who went with him. Now Samuel, excuse me, now Saul is building his forces, his men who will loyally follow him as a king should have. But here we see some men rebelled, said, how can this man save us? Now, what they're meaning is that this was at a time when Israel was struggling to establish itself in the land, which actually is not that much different than Israel today, who constantly fight people for ownership of the promised land. Now, Israel spread out across that region, and you can look at study Bibles and look at the maps and see the allotments of the tribes. But as I said in previous episodes, they were still a ragtag group of tribes fighting off enemies to control the land. God was giving them success, but we see constant disobedience, as we saw in the earlier chapters of 1 Samuel, led to problems. Because Israel was acting foolishly, they weren't listening to the Lord at different times, they would lose territory or they would be captured by the enemy, or they would suffer different problems. So when the people said this, how can this man save us? They're referring to salvation from their enemies. And that's pretty much what I would say unspiritual Israelites thought of when they said, save us. And that's kind of common for people when you say, save someone, save me. It's because you're referring to something that you're in, you're in a problem with, you're dealing with. You need salvation. You need someone to come help you, get you out of this. And that's what the Jews meant when they said, save us, or Hosanna, when Jesus walked or rode on the donkey into Jerusalem. They took all those palm branches, what we call Palm Sunday, they laid them on the ground in front of him, and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. We think that means salvation from our sins, but they were thinking, save us from Rome, give us back our kingdom. Very much the same way these people were thinking so many years earlier when Saul was made their king. They were only thinking about, again, their earthly circumstances. They weren't thinking about God's plan. You know, Saul wrote this book about royalty, and that would have been very much like what the law said about royalty, about how they're supposed to follow God. In fact, 
this book that Samuel writes is in obedience to the law because in the law it says when there's a king, write down the law in a book for him, give it to him. The Levites are supposed to provide this book so that he may read it and study it. So this is very much what Samuel is doing as he's a Levite and he has a connection with the priesthood and the law. And so he wrote down this book. When he says the behavior of the royalty, he's talking about the behavior that God expects from the king, which includes the writing of the law. So Samuel is meant not just to be a physical deliverer of the people, which was a part of his job, but a judge, much like Samuel was. He's essentially his successor, and so he's supposed to know the law and judge the people according to the law and be that guidance, that teacher, that shepherd of the people in God's ways. That, more than anything else, should have been his primary job. How can I obey the Lord, and how can I teach the people to continue to serve the Lord? through my example, through my judging, and so forth. But the people only cared about how Saul can save their butts from the Philistines. And this eerily mirrors what the Jews thought of Jesus when they saw him. He was their deliverer. He wasn't just an earthly king who would rule for a short period of time. He was the promised Messiah, the Holy One who would deliver his people and rule and reign forever. But many of them said, much the same thing that this man said. They said, how can this be the son of David? How can this man be our Messiah? There's no way this can happen. Because they were judging things by their earthly understanding, by the flesh, by their own reasoning. And the reason why that's so dangerous is because, of course, you're ignoring what God is saying, but our earthly understanding is rooted in the flesh. And as the Bible says in Romans 8, in Galatians 5, our flesh wars against the spirit. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. In the flesh, we can do nothing. It's only by the spirit of God, who operates through the truth of God's word, does anything that we do prosper. Because it's in accordance and in alignment with God's truth and what he's teaching us and what he wants us to do. That's why we call faith obedience. Because faith and obedience go hand in hand. Faith in God's word is obedience. And faith in God's word produces obedience. But when we judge things by our earthly circumstances, we are relying in our flesh, which craves sin. It craves things that go against God's plan. And the people of Israel here, some of them, were doubting Saul and rebelling against Saul because they were judging by the flesh. They didn't want Saul to deliver them. They doubted that he could, even though he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. The prophet Samuel just told them This was our deliverer. This is the man who will save us, who will lead us. God anointed him, and they still said, this man can't save us. When people speak from that place of doubt, it tells us two things. One, the Spirit of God is not with them, or they're not listening to and obeying the Spirit of God, who is the one who grants us faith and obedience. And two, they have an ulterior motive. See, doubt isn't just God's word is not strong enough to convince me it's true. That's never the case. God's word is so powerful. The Bible says it splits soul and spirit and splits joints and marrow. That's how powerful God's word is. But the reason why someone doubts it is because they have faith in something else. Charles Spurgeon said doubt in God's word is faith in the devil. So when someone is doubting what God is doing, even right in front of them, as we saw in chapter 10 twice, is because their faith is is in something contrary to God. And these men, the Bible said, were rebels, which not just means rebels against Saul, because he just became king, they're rebels against God's word, rebels against God. Chances are they had an ulterior motive where maybe they wanted to be king, or chances are they wanted someone within their tribe to be king. The different tribes for a very long time had rivalries, And if you jump back to the book of Judges at the very end, the tribe of Benjamin was not on good terms with the rest of the nation. In fact, there was something of a civil war because a group of Benjamites did something terrible to a man. And he got the rest of the tribes to turn against them and they nearly wiped out the tribe of Benjamin. They had to find wives for the survivors from the other tribes just so they could continue to live. And I wouldn't be surprised if that rivalry or that resentment continued even to the day of this moment. And so these men said, can this man really save us? Remember what the Benjamites did all those years ago? It would have been 
generations ago, but they still would have remembered it. It was a pretty dramatic story. And so their motives weren't in God. I mean, God picked Saul for a reason. He picked him from the tribe of Benjamin for a reason. There would have been many Jews who would have thought, really? You're picking a Benjamite after what they did back then? If you're curious about the story, I won't go into it, but it's in uh, the last book of Judges, to the last books of Judges. It's pretty intense and pretty shocking, but it gives you an understanding of why the rest of Israel might not want a Benjamite to be their king. But those who were obedient to God went with him to serve him. But those with ulterior motives who have maybe have wanted the, one of their own to rule, maybe wanted someone from Judah or from another tribe, Dan, Naphtali, etc., Maybe they wanted one of their own, but because they had ulterior motive, faith in something else, in their flesh, in a fleshy desire, they doubted God. But we see the last verse, the last line of this chapter says, but he held his peace, which of course means he kept silent. And this is referring to Saul. Okay, certainly not Samuel. Samuel was not a man who kept silent. Samuel was a man who would not back down from a challenge, as we see even later on. He does some pretty intense things in the book. But we know Saul was often afraid of people. We know he worried about what people thought. And even though he was called to be king, these men were rebels. He was silent. Now, this was important because the king was supposed to unite all the tribes under his leadership. And they should become one nation, one kingdom, who would be obedient to the king and bring glory to the Lord. But immediately, the first day Saul is made king, there's men saying, this man can't save us. And the Bible says they're rebels. They're not just doubting, but they're deliberately rebelling against the authority that God put over them. Now, Saul's response should have been obvious. He's now king, so he carries great authority. And the Bible says these men were rebels. It wasn't just people murmuring and talking on, you know, under their breath. They were deliberately disobeying the authority God had put over them. So Saul had every right to go to them and demand their obedience, demand their, said they said presence, which would be like tribute or gifts for the new king to make sure that you're honoring him and hopefully he'll be, you know, appreciative, that kind of thing. They didn't do any of that. So Saul had every right to say, you're dead. Now, he didn't necessarily have to kill him, but he could have sent you know, envoys to say, you're rebelling against me, you better come in line or you'll face judgment. He had every right to do that, but he kept his peace. Once again, we see Saul, sadly, not stepping into the role God has called for him because he's judging, just like the people, by his own circumstances. And for him, it means he's worried about what people think and are afraid of them, even though God has anointed them. So our takeaway, of course, as I've been seeing throughout this chapter, is that we cannot judge by the flesh, by what our eyes see. We need to walk in the truth that God is teaching us, what God is revealing to us in our personal lives. And even if that conflicts with what we see in the flesh, we reject the things of this world and instead embrace the truth of God's word. And we also need to learn not to fall into the same trap that Saul did. This is so common for all of us. It's so easy to start worrying about what other people think. Even as Christians, and even if you're a leader or want to be a leader in the church, it is so important for you to first and foremost stop worrying about what people think. There are some pastors so terrified that the pews won't be full every Sunday that they change the messages that they would preach in order to appeal to the masses. It's what Paul called preaching what their itching ears want to hear. So instead of telling them the truth that they need to learn, that they may hear and be saved and be obedient to the Lord, they change their message so it sounds more appealing to people's sinful flesh. And hey, they got packed out churches. They got mega churches. They have three or four or five services a Sunday and so many people want to come. But is what they're teaching accurate? What the, is what they're teaching true? Maybe not. And some people are so worried about what the, their families think or their, their co-workers think or what their community thinks that they won't speak up. They won't speak the word of God. They won't be a witness to Christ. And you might think, well, that's okay. I'm just going to keep to myself. Stay silent. Things don't stand in one place. You're either growing or you're receding. Either the light is shining or the darkness is growing. It's one or the other. So if you stay silent, if you hide your light just to be accepted by the world, the world will press in against you and you will soon find yourself acting and thinking 
and behaving like them because you were so concerned with their acceptance and you won their acceptance. Now you're around them all the time. You're not influencing them for the things of God, for the kingdom of God. They're influencing you because you're not speaking up. You're not shining your light. You're not exhibiting biblical character to them that they might see the truth. Instead, they're influencing you. So we need to learn from Saul. We see in the later chapters, as we get into it in future episodes, how this problem persists to the very end of his rule. So we need to examine our own hearts and prayerfully say, Lord, expose in my heart any fear of man, any of this trap that may I walk in complete obedience with you, so that I may bring glory to you in everything that I say and do. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. Our show is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, also at lightningpodcast.org.